You are listening to Single Smart Female. This is us letting it all hang out for your love life, examining Steph's dating experiences, and answering your hot topic dating questions. Just you, Steph, and me. No topic is off limits and no filters involved. This is Jen. And I'm Steph. If you have a question about your love life that you would like us to answer, you can submit your question at singlesmartfemale.com. Hello and welcome, Single Smart Female. This is Jen, your host, joined by my co-host, Steph, who is giving me a very interesting look right now. We have a show you will not want to miss today. And I want to say that this show is probably going to put some women on guard. (laughs) Ruffle a few feathers? Yes, crinkle a few knickers. (laughs) <laughs> some knicker, knicker crinkling going on here at single the, smart female the term knickers is it just feels appropriate it does it does <laughs> <laughs> but um i really want you ladies to if your guard goes up if things start to trigger you at all i want you to take a step back from it and listen and hear what we're talking about today at single smart female because what we're bringing you can dramatically help your love life. Now, the source that it's coming from is a very well-educated source that is, she is joining us today um, for, for this interview. Her name is Alice Little, and she's coming to us from the Moonlight Bunny Ranch. Moonlight Bunny Ranch. Now, Yes, if you know what the Moonlight Bunny Ranch is, yes, that is a legal brothel in Nevada. And yes, she is a legal sex worker. I specifically, she calls herself, and I like to refer to her as a modern day courtesan, which you will learn a bit about courtesans and the courtesan arts during this conversation because these things can significantly help your dating life and actually help your love life as well. So you start in your dating life, you can incorporate some of these courtesan arts into your dating life and let them lead into a love life. So if you're the woman that wants to have a forever man, this information is going to be great for you. You're the woman who wants to date different men indefinitely. This information is going to work for you. But I want you to, if you were triggered when we said brothel, if you were triggered when I said legal sex worker, I want you to take a step back and I want you to listen to this woman and really hear her because what she has, she's a wealth of knowledge, a wellspring of information that can really help you. Plus, she's, she's just phenomenal to talk to. Steph, didn't you have a great time? Oh, yeah. I had a, a wonderful time. She's very intelligent, very articulate, and has a lot of interesting tidbits to share. Yes. I feel much more educated and I want all of you single smart females out there to let us help you heat up your love life in the right way. By the way, ladies, before we get started, just know that during the interview, Alice mentioned several products and potential discounts for these products that can be very helpful to you. All of that will be listed underneath our show at jenburton.com forward slash Alice. So that's J-E-N-N-B-U-R-T-O-N dot com forward slash Alice. This show is brought to you by Irresistibility, help for women with online dating. Are you experiencing inbox crickets or real life crazies? It's not you, it's your online profile. Let us help you do online dating that leads to real-life love and romance. Go to helpmeonlinedate.com and we will send you the first two video chapters of our program for free. Hi, Alice. It's so great to have you with us today. How are you doing? I'm doing great. Thank you so much for having me. I'm so excited to be here. I'm... (laughs) We're very... We're excited to have you here. Steph, I'm thinking you should start with the first question. Okay. All right, Alice, are you ready? Absolutely. Bring it on. (laughs) Okay. In your expert opinion, is there a difference between a courtesan and a prostitute? 
And if so, what is it? Well, I think to best answer that question, we have to first start off by defining what a sex worker is. Both of those terms fall under what I call the sex work umbrella. Under the the sex work umbrella, you have everything from people providing in-person sexual services. You have women that are working in strip clubs. You have porn actresses, phone sex operators, cam models. There's a whole wide variety. And two of the categories within that is going to be someone who is a prostitute and somebody who is a courtesan. Personally, I define a courtesan as being a primary type of sex worker, meaning that they're providing in-person sex services, but they're also providing something else. They're providing intimacy, education. They're providing a safe space for people to really explore their sexuality, be it man, be it a woman, be it a couple, whatever, whatever it so may be. It gives someone the space and the opportunity to really explore themselves beyond just that one single note of sex. When it comes to a prostitute, I have found that most prostitutes prefer to be called sex workers rather than prostitutes. And the way that they tend to approach things is a little bit more direct when it comes to focusing on the sexual services and the pleasure type services. So that tends to be the difference is where the focus is. One focuses more on sex and primarily sex. The other one focuses on more than just sex. Okay, so Alice, just just for clarity, when people use the term prostitute, is it is it considered to be almost derogatory or insulting in some way to sex workers? It's kind of a controversial term. Some sex workers have decided to take back that term and own the word prostitute. Other women say, no, we do not want to be called prostitutes. We find that very offensive. And so it's kind of a hotly debated word. On a legal standpoint, what's interesting to note is that all of the documentation for myself and the women at the Moonlight Bunny Ranch, it shows us as prostitutes. When I go to fill out my working card, my position is that of a prostitute. Each year, we have to go to the sheriff's office and reapply for our license. And it's literally a prostitution license. Many people have asked for that to be changed to a legal sex work license, a courtesan license, perhaps something other than the word prostitute. But as of this exact moment, it's still considered a prostitution license. That's, that is. That's interesting. Now, I became fascinated with you, Alice, because of the fact that you called yourself a modern day courtesan. And I am enamored with the idea of courtesans. It's um, something that I. I haven't studied extensively by any means, but I dabble my toe in every once in a while and I have, I have my favorites. But I, I want to know, why have courtesans been such an important piece of our history to you? Historically speaking, courtesans have always been front and center when it comes to anything to do with politics, anything to do with rulership. And anything to do with religion, if we go all the way back to ancient Assyrian Babylonian times, there was a thing referred to as the sacred prostitute or sacred sex worker courtesan. And that was actually something that was considered to be religiously significant and incredibly important and respected. In certain cultures, it was tradition that every single member of the society would go to the temple of Aphrodite and spend time with one of her sex priests at that particular location. I think that it's so important because sex workers and courtesans, we've been educating about sex since the dawn of time. We've always been the sexual educators, the keepers of sexual knowledge, and part of our job is getting to share that knowledge with others. Now, I know from the research I have done, historically, courtesans didn't want to be called prostitutes up at least until the 19th century that prostitutes were, again, it was, I think, as you referred to in our modern day society, it was more, it was more transactional, whereas courtesans provide an experience. Can you elaborate on that? For sure. Um, A typical day with me totally varies. When someone comes to seek out my services, we may go out for dinner and have an amazing romantic encounter first. We may focus in on sexual pleasure and how to give a woman an orgasm. Sometimes it's focused on everything but the sex and it's just romance and cuddling and touching and getting that face-to-face human intimacy. 
Versus, say, with a prostitute, the experience is almost textbook. You come in, you get off, then you leave. Boom, boom, boom. Okay. And throughout history, this is something that's been going on. You're you're talking about the experience, which we're going to talk about in a minute, that one of your most popular experiences is the girlfriend experience. And what I am gathering with all of the research that I have done, plus what we teach here at Single Smart Female and helping women interact differently with men, is that a woman, her desirability really comes from not necessarily her knowledge of pleasuring a man, although that's very beneficial, but her real intimacy with herself, her understanding with herself. And I'm, I, I have a feeling that you, you would confirm this, that a lot of the men come to you are very interested in figuring out what pleasures you and how to, okay, for just the sex part, get you off. Plus, really know you on a different level it's which feeds into that girlfriend experience do you find that to be true absolutely true i would say about 75 percent of the time guys come in and rather than me asking hey what are you interested in what can i do for you instead the table is turned and they go you know i really want to have an amazing experience for you too. What do you enjoy? What would you like to go and do? And they're really interested in that dynamic exchange of information and getting to know each other on a really deep, personal and intimate level. And it's not just the men that come in for that. A lot of the women that come in too, they want to know, how do I please another female? How do I interact with another woman's body and another female's energy? What does that look like? How does that actually happen in an organic and honest way? Where do you start with them on that, with a woman or or a man teaching them? Where's the one of your favorite places to start on teaching um, somebody how to, I guess, open up a woman in different in different ways, not just not just sexually. It really starts with the communication skills and having the language to describe the types of things that we need, want, and desire. Unfortunately, in our society, when it comes to sex education, we completely skip over this whole point of consent and we skip over the point of communication. We're no longer asking each other what sorts of sexual activities do you enjoy, and instead we're fumbling around trying to figure out how to ask what type of condom to use. And it tends to take the standpoint where communication is no longer sexy. So I really like to start with making communication sexy again. How do you talk to your partner about how to please them? And so I like to give people specific language skills. Um, A good takeaway might be, show me. I want you to show me how you please yourself and teach me how I can please you. The alternative to that might be, I want to watch you please yourself and then I'm going to please myself and we'll be able to learn from each other. And it ends up creating this really sexy feedback loop where one person is going, yeah, right there. And the other one saying, oh, a little bit to the left. And that's okay. It's okay to say, no, no, a little bit to the left, a little bit up, a little bit harder. (laughs) Nope. Yes, 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 yes. Too hard. Oh, yeah. Too hard. And and that (laughs) feedback, that dynamic feedback as something is happening is the only way, the only way to get to that highest epitome of sex where everybody is having a pleasurable experience rather than it just shifting to, oh, well, he wants to get me off, so... I'm just going to fake it and that'll be fine. No, let's let's actually get you off. It's okay. Let's adjust the language so this way he's able to accomplish that because he wants to. He genuinely wants to please you. You just have to teach him how. So uh, speaking of that, though, I, I do know, um, I know a lot of women, even myself sometimes, um, can be a little bit uncomfortable with the language portion. Like, I'm really good at giving signals, like, yes, like, I like this, you know, a moan or whatever, that I'm very vocal on, but, like, actually using my words, it gets very difficult. How do you make, how do you put someone at ease? And how, how can, especially a woman, um, when she just doesn't feel comfortable using her words? just yet. The way I like to start things off is with a very simple exercise. I usually have the woman lay down on her back and whatever method that she uses at home to masturbate, go ahead and use that method. But while that is happening, describe the sensations that she's feeling. 
oh, it feels like tingles. Ooh, it feels like ice. Ooh, it feels like a little bit of static electricity. It's a little bit sharp and it's sweet and it's pleasurable. And it starts to give them organic language that works for their body. Not everyone describes and experiences sex and sexual pleasure in the same way. And so it's really important to personalize the type of language. So when you lean back, close your eyes, and you're just speaking out loud rather than speaking to a specific person, you're speaking for yourself. You're speaking as to your needs and your desires rather than perhaps shifting them over to make them sexier for someone else. There's no need to change the language. It's whatever is genuine and honest is the perfect language to use. If it feels warm and wonderful and sweet and sensual, that's the language. If it feels like electricity and pins and needles and like static shock, then that's the language that works for you and your body. It lets your partner know what kind of experiences that you're feeling. And on a personal level, it puts you more so in touch with your own sexuality. It gives you the opportunity to explore, ooh, I really like a little bit of pressure here that feels really warm and soft and that really turns me on versus oh, right when I'm starting to get close, then I like a different type of pressure. I like a different type of pressure. I want a vibrator. I want a, a finger added in at that point. Whatever it so may be, it allows us to explore our bodies and then find the language to describe the exploration that we're doing. I am curious about what you have noticed, like the differences. I, I, I know that we're all different and uh, very different in some ways, but there's some really marked differences between a woman orgasming and a man orgasming. And what, you know, the, what do you find in general is really helpful to a woman versus a man? Well, the, the first thing that I really notice is the timing of the arousal. Women we're like a diesel engine. We need a little bit of warm up, right? We need we need a little bit of extra TLC, a little bit of care. We want foreplay. We want things to be slowed down. We want to get our engines purring, for lack of a better term. Whereas guys are guys are like a shotgun. Guys are bam bam ready to go. They are like on it. They're excited. They have hit the peak of their arousal and they are ready to go. They are prepared to have sex right from the get go. Their anatomy is simply that which they achieve an erection and then they can have sex. Whereas with women, we actually have to arouse our bodies, which can take 12 to 14 minutes for an arousal cycle to fully initiate before we're truly ready on a physical level to even begin having sex. So slowing things down as a woman is going to be essential to improving your sexual love life. Okay, so Steph and I were talking about this and... What we have noticed with men is when men figure out that you like something, they go to the same thing over and over again. And it can be on your body. It can be in life. Like, for instance, if they see that you like a really specific piece of chocolate, uh, they will give you the same chocolate every <laughs> fucking day for the rest of the year till you never want to see that damn piece of chocolate again. And sometimes, and it's my, I love men, by the way, I know I'm sounding, I sound very aggravated with them at this moment, but sometimes they do the same thing on your body. So if they figure out, you know, maybe and they took their time and then all of a sudden they discovered your nipples and, it, and by that time you were really aroused, but then they start going straight to your nipples. It's uh, to your nipples, to your nipples. And it can be very disconcerting for women. What what do you offer them? I mean, I know what I, I tell women, but I'm, I'm curious, Alice, as somebody who is an, is an expert in all, ther all areas of sex, what do you offer them communication-wise or maybe nonverbal cues, maybe hand placement, things like that? What do you offer women so that they can really get men to respond properly to their different levels of turn-on? Depending on a woman's comfortability, communicating to her partner on a nonverbal level what you can do is slowly shift his head shift his hands put them in the right place and then kind of place your hand over his and move his hands across your body in such a way that you're showing him other pleasure spots and you'll almost want to overemphasize for example if he's been focusing on your nipples shift his hand down to your inner thigh squeeze his hand when it gets there and then really lean into his hand so he knows I really like this too. That's a really great nonverbal way of describing it. If you're comfortable using a little bit of language, it might be a combination of shifting him into the correct position and saying, here, Sh telling him literally right here, this is what I like. 
So you could simply use one word here, this, yes. And it's giving him a vocal cue as well as a physical cue that now he is doing the right thing. If someone's gotten really comfortable with themselves and with communicating with their partner, I actually recommend setting the guy down and being like, I want to give you a show. I want to show you what I like. And then I want you to do it to me. And then you literally show him on your body how you like to be touched and you let him watch. And for a lot of guys, this can be a turn on. I'm not a huge fan of porn because it causes men to stimulate themselves. But in this particular situation, you're giving him visual stimulation, but then you're going to be following through and providing sexual stimulation too, rather than him just whacking one off on his own and potentially being too aggressive with his body. Yeah, this is something I I didn't realize and you educated me on. I didn't realize that men can actually injure their penises through aggressive masturbation masturbation. Oh, yeah. I I mean, for men, their anatomy should be as such that just a simple light pressure and stroking of the hand should be adequate for them to achieve erection and orgasm. Unfortunately, what we're seeing is a lot of men who have what I call death grip syndrome. They are tugging on it as if they're trying to rip it off. (laughs) And when you're using that amount of pressure and friction, you're actually causing micro tears in the skin, which causes damage to your nerves. Therefore, over time, you're receiving less and less and less pleasure, and it's becoming more and more difficult for you to achieve an orgasm through sex. I always say that the cure for death grip is the fleshlight. Get it out of your hand and put it in (laughs) something else that isn't going to be squeezing you so tight you're losing blood flow. And so fleshlights are kind of nice because it's a softer silicone material. And frankly, you're not going to hurt yourself if you're using that. There you go. uh, Alice, do you get a commission from Fleshlight? I don't. I do not, unfortunately. (laughs) You should call Uh, them. (laughs) We, we, we should help her arrange that. That's, that's pretty good. Okay, so I want to bring it back to courtesans here in a minute, but I am curious, are there things that women are doing that's actually as damaging to their bodies as men are doing? Oh, this is a great question. I would say so, yes. Um, the biggest thing that I see women doing to damage their bodies is using non-body safe products. As women, we use everything from different body washes, different types of sex toys, different types of lube, different types of condom. Well, men have exterior equipment. And so if we put lube on their body, it's not going internally. For us as women, we have to make sure we're using body safe products in all all facets from our toys to our body washes to make sure that we're taking care of our bodies. Biologically speaking, uh, the vagina is a very sensitive organism. You really have to look at the vagina and go, there's a physiology here. There is a bacterial component where it has to be balanced in a certain way. Otherwise, you end up with... It's an ecosystem. Oh, yes. Otherwise, you end up with problems like yeast infections. Mm -hmm. And so women who are running into problems with their own sexual wellness in that regard are probably finding themselves using non-body safe products. So I always recommend talking to your gynecologist to find a safe body wash specifically for your vagina. It's different than your hair. It's different than your back. You need a specific product in order to clean it appropriately. The other thing that I see women doing far too often is douching. There is this Douching's bad. thought that vaginas... Yeah. Oh, douching is the worst thing you could possibly do to your body. There's this misconception that we have as women due to a lack of sexual education that our vaginas are somehow dirty and they need to smell a certain way and they have to be cleaned. Well, vaginas are self-cleaning. Exactly. It's already built in biologically that as we go through life, our vagina is going to clean itself, take care of itself. And so when we use something like a douche, we're killing our body's ability to enjoy and actually be healthy. And instead, we're causing and introducing irritations and we're limiting our own sexual experiences by attempting to take care of ourselves in a non-biologically appropriate way. When it comes to, um, I was going to say, when it comes to condoms and sex toys, that's the other thing that you really have to be careful about. Certain products have BPA in them, which is now shown to cause cancer. It's prevalent enough so that even in plastic containers used for young children, you'll all see that they have BPA-free. 
Yes. Then why in the world are we putting BPA in our sex toys? That's going into our bodies. And depending on our sexual lives, it could be going into your body on a regular basis. So you really want to make sure that you're using BPA-free sex toys and using toys that have biologically appropriate components. Okay. We are going to, underneath the show, link to places that um, Alice recommends for getting these products for all of you ladies. Now, I want to move it back to courtesans because courtesans fascinate. The sex part absolutely 100% fascinates me, but being a courtesan is so much more than the sexual component. And the I, I have to know, who was your favorite courtesan historically? I really am enamored with a woman by the name of Julia Bulett. She was prominent in Virginia City, which is located right here in Nevada, during the time of the Big Bonanza, which was the big gold rush that we experienced during the 1800s and early 1900s here in Nevada. It's what caused westward expansion. And in many ways, Julia Bulett was very much so a central and integral part of the society there. When she eventually died, she was actually murdered by one of her clients that was stealing her jewels and her money. The town was so enamored and in love with her that there was a massive procession to take her out of town and give her a final burial. There are museums in Virginia City. There are buildings that have her name. She is an icon, and you can actually visit her grave in Virginia City. If I'm not mistaken, I've actually been there. She was known to be, oh yeah, she was known to be an incredibly brilliant, well-educated woman. And what's spoken most of Julia Bulet and the limited amounts of history that we still have is her prominence within the town and within the fire department. At the time, the biggest risk to life and homes and business was fire. Yes. Because of the location of Virginia City, it was up there in the mountains. If a fire broke out, there was almost no way to stop it. I mean, at one point in time, half of Virginia City actually burnt to the ground. At any rate, Julia Bulette was known for being a huge supporter of the fire department, enough so that she was actually made an honorary member of the local fire department. Wow. Okay, that I didn't know. Okay, this, uh, I love these stories, but this brings up a really great point. So you were talking about there's not a lot of history. And the truth is, is that there isn't a lot of documented history on uh, courtesans because of the fact that most of them, you know, had very elite clients. So they didn't want to document a lot of what was going on is my understanding of it. And I have been fascinated by this dynamic that these women held because up until the 19th century, these were some of the most educated women in the world. Whereas the average woman, even women in certain high social circles, they didn't have the opportunity to be educated because it wasn't part of their position. And um, I, uh, how, how does that influence you? Knowing all, all of this, how does that influence you? Because obviously, we think when you talk, when you talk about sex worker, when you, talk, when you even say courtesan, when you say prostitute, when you say all of those different things, and I, and I see them, of course, like you do in, in different levels and in different genres, so to speak. But women, their first interpretation of it is it's all about the sex. It's not. It's companionship in many ways. It's in, like you, I think the term you use is legal companionship. And it's something that we've been referring to historically. So historically, men would have their wives and then they would have the women that they actually loved and, and they end up supporting them in many ways and paid for their services. Although we are talking, there is a difference between a mistress and, and um, a courtesan. If, am I correct in saying that? Yes, that is correct. Generally speaking, a mistress services one man and one man only. A courtesan is servicing multiple men is the the defining difference there. Um, But these women built um, a lot of wealth based on their ability to hold a man's attention. And that wasn't just sexual attention, which fascinates me because we as women can understand these courtesan arts and use it to our advantage in our single life. And and take from dating and making dating a really amazing experience, understanding what these women knew, not only about men, but just about the dynamic between men and women and understanding the power that they possess over men and use it in an integrity to have more of what you want romantically. I was reading the that so what they termed a public woman, which is an, I, another word and 
for Kama, uh, sorry, for courtesan. But according to the Kama Sutra, a this public woman had to be versed in the 64 art. You know what I'm talking about? Have you heard of this? Oh, yes. Intimately familiar with it. <laughs> and it's a very interesting <laughs> style of looking at sexuality because there is this educational component to it that is incredibly important. And that's a really great example of just what that can manifest as is would be that particular type of woman described in the Kama Sutra. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Alan, um, are you proficient in all 64 arts? I wouldn't say all 64 hours, but I would certainly <laughs> say at least 69 of them. <laughs> we added a few in there for fun. Speaking of this, as a courtesan and as a modern day courtesan, I, I want to know what do you want women to know about you? What do you think, what judgments do you think women have that maybe they're just not aware of? And is really, it's creating a wall between what you do and what women can actually, even just by learning from you gain in their love lives the very first misconception is that as a courtesan i want to steal your husband and end your relationship that could not be any further from the truth because if anything i want to make your relationship stronger i want to be able to give these guys the skills that they need both sexually as well as with interpersonal communication that they can bring back to their relationships to make better relationships happen. I'm not looking to get into a relationship myself because I'm looking to help educate and I'm looking to have experiences with more than one individual. So the first thing that I would have to say is don't feel as if I'm going to steal your partner. That is definitely not my goal. My goal is to make your life better by proxy. The other thing (laughs) that a lot of people don't understand is that men are afraid to talk about sex. They don't want to admit that they may not know as much as they need to, and they're not sure how to get that knowledge. And so a lot of times they're scared to ask their partner, how can I have better sex? What can I be doing better in my relationship? And so and sometimes I get called in to help with those types of situations. Well, here's what you could be doing better sexually. Here are some skills that you could take home and really bring back to your partner. When it comes to a woman looking at a courtesan or a sex worker and what they can learn, I would say self-confidence in their sexuality. You're a sexual being and that's okay. We all were brought into this world by sex. And more likely than not, all of us will get to have sex a part of our, as part of our adult lives. Sex isn't a dirty word in the same way that penis and vagina aren't dirty words. They're the words that we use to describe certain acts, certain body parts. And so please don't feel as if you need to censor your language when it comes to your own body. You have a vagina and that is okay to talk about your vagina. It's okay to identify what makes your vagina feel good. It's okay to explore your body and find out what is it that really makes me tick. Now, how can I teach my partner how to make me tick? Okay. So I know via your website that one of your most common asked questions is, how did you get into this? But I kind of, there's something I want to talk about in it, not just about how you got into this, but why I'm so fascinated with you is because you are a woman who enjoys sex, the exploration of sex and said, you know what? I am stepping into this and choosing and choosing this as as my work and seeing and seeing where that takes you. I find that extraordinarily. I, I know other people might have other women might have their judgments about it, but I find that extraordinarily empowering as a woman to step into that paradigm and say, you know, this is I'm going to make this mine and I'm going to make a fuck ton of money off of it at the same time. That to me, <laughs> yeah, that to me speaks volumes in a very positive way that I don't think I can even articulate completely. I'm going to think about it some more and see if I can come to exactly what it is. But it fascinates me. It mesmerizes. And I'm not exactly a highly sexual person by any means. This, this is just, I love a woman who owns who she is and makes a shit ton of money off of it and says, I'm going to take mine in this world and I'm going to enjoy doing it. Is there any piece of that, you know, that you want women to know any more to that about how you came into this? I think a lot of people have the misconception that first I'm in it for the money and I'm in it to take advantage of the people that I'm spending time with. 
that's the opposite of what I'm there to do. My goal is instead to give a really positive experience to somebody and be fairly compensated for that particular experience I'm providing. Much in the same way that when you spend time with a doctor or a therapist, they're going to ask you questions about your health and they're genuinely invested in your health. But at the same time, you know that this is a transactional relationship. You, you pay your massage therapist much in the same way that you would pay your courtesan. And so I like to think of myself as a professional, but my specialty is perhaps a little bit different. Rather than my specialty being psychology, my specialty is intimacy. It's not, it's not sex, it's intimacy, because it's all of the skills around and surrounding sex rather than just the actual sex skills. The, the other thing I really want people to understand is that a lot of the women who are entering this industry, much like myself, are incredibly well-educated. We have multiple college graduates. We have women who have degrees in all sorts of different fields. And we have women that have made this their lifelong career, that have been in this industry for 10 plus years that truly are a career courtesan. That option exists in society, and there's a reason it exists in society. Society needs this service, and so by providing that service, we're providing a service to all of society. We're filling a true and genuine need. Yes, the intimacy is a huge disconnect in the society, in my, in, in my opinion. And I know that you are you are very passionate about people also understanding, because I know you were talking about sex as mainly as a tool that for a bigger a bigger umbrella of intimacy but the sex talking about the sex part of it that is you see that as also a physical need correct yes I, I think that sex can and oftentimes is a need more so than a want or desire i define needs as something that is integral to your mental physical spiritual and in this case your sexual health all of those things tie together and they can affect all sorts of things from your blood pressure to your heart rate to your metabolism, believe it or not. There's an incredible wide range of things that can be affected through having sex. After having sex, a man's heart rate oftentimes goes down a little bit and his blood pressure decreases. He relaxes a little bit more. When it comes to women, when they've actually enjoyed themselves sexually, it gets all their hormones going. It gets everything flowing in a very, very natural way. Um, much in the same way that it's been a long-standing thing that if we are cramping, go masturbate because it's going to help with your cramps. It can be an incredible tool for other types of pain management too. Headaches, backaches, all of those things through sexual gratification can help women incredibly, incredibly so. And then when it comes down to other types of needs, they too can really, really be addressed when you handle the sex component of need. Perfect. Okay, so I want to go back to your girlfriend experience again. And I want to bring this up because you do do, is this girlfriend experience, do you offer this for women? All the time. I offer it for women. I offer it for men. I offer it for couples. And I offer it for virgins and those who are disabled. It's an experience that's honest, open, connective, communicative, romantic, intimate. It's all of these things all rolled into one. It's all of the cherry-picked best parts of a relationship combined together to give somebody an encounter where they can really lean in and enjoy that experience. So I was I was listening to you on another interview with a man who was probing you about the, you know, why would would men pay for this experience? And I knew the answer right away. And I knew I, I know you kept coming back to him and giving him different different versions of him. He kept coming coming back and said, I don't think that you're answering my question. And I'm wondering, I'm wondering where you're at on that question, because I know why this is one of your most requested experiences, especially I I know I see from 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 women and from couples, but especially from men. And where are you at on that? What do you feel like is the reason why men really want that experience with you? And it's so interesting because I'm of the opinion that the genuine answer varies from man to man. No two men have the same truth as to why they are seeking out a service. If you're looking at a man that's disabled and in a wheelchair, 
he may be wanting my service to regain his confidence. And he's wanting to have that girlfriend experience because he feels as if he can't get that on his own because of his wheelchair. If you're talking to, say, a single woman wanting to know why they would want the girlfriend experience and why they would want to purchase the girlfriend experience, it's because they're wanting to acknowledge and wanting to appreciate a relationship scenario in which they can and have the right to be a little bit selfish when it comes to talking about their sexual needs. It allows you to put your needs and desires at the forefront, whether it be a man, whether it be a woman. So I think there's lots of reasons why somebody would seek out the girlfriend experience. But I would say overarching is that it gives you permission to be yourself. When you're doing the girlfriend experience, you are who you are at its raw, true and honest form without any sort of posturing, without having to be someone to suit them, you get to be yourself. And for a lot of men, that's freeing because they don't know how to be themselves in a relationship. They don't know how to open up at that level. I'm going to uh, actually Steph needs to say something there. Well, I just want to make sure that we're clarifying for everybody what the girlfriend experience is. Alice, this is basically you're going on a date first. You're getting time, taking time to get to know somebody. That is that correct? Yes. Like more on like a, a kind of a relationship style versus just sex. Yes, it's, it's a lot more than just the sexual component with the girlfriend experience. Usually the girlfriend experience is married hand in hand with something called an outdate, which is where we leave the physical property of the brothel and actually go out and explore Nevada and have this joint mutually enjoyable experience. Sometimes this looks like dinner and a show. Sometimes it's bowling. Sometimes it's going to a comic convention together. It can take any number of format and activity. I've been sledding, snowboarding, skiing, horseback riding, out to dinner, out to shows, down to Vegas, an incredibly wide range of different activities that happened as part of the girlfriend experience. That shared mutualistic experience outside the best bedroom tends to tie its way back into the bedroom. Shared experience give us, gives us something to talk about and it helps create a deeper sense of intimacy. Uh, exactly. That's where I was going with this. This overarching theme for me and from what I see with uh, women have a very big misconception about what men really want and that it's just about sex and it's just about they're just trying to figure out ways to have sex. Well, they're, when you are hiring somebody as any type of sex worker on, on any level, it can be transactional if you so choose. But they hire somebody such as Alice because she brings a component of intelligence of, uh, and of intimacy that they're, they're learning how to develop. So yeah, they get to be themselves within that context and explore it. But ultimately, it's because men, everybody is, but men truly are attracted to and drawn to intimacy. And women have a very jaded notion about that. And that's what I really wanted to press on it. And I wanted, I want women to hear is that a man doesn't need to pay for that type of experience if, if it was just about sex. It's not. It's not just about sex. Sex is common. Anybody can have sex. Yes, anybody can have sex. But men are craving that connection and intimacy just as much as women are. The problem, there's a disconnect with how we're, communicating about it and how women are have all these misconceived notions about what men think and what men want based on behavior that they're misinterpreting and not evaluating what's going on within themselves. I wanted Alice here, and Steph, and Steph knows this, I wanted Alice here so that we can start debunking all these myths about men and so that we can really get down to what's important to women focus on, you know, learning about herself, her own pleasure, her sexual pleasure, her, her wants, her needs, and, and then starting to interpret men's behavior differently, communicating with them differently, and having women having more of what they want, starting with being single. So, you know, I got an email from a lady the other day. Men are just so exhausting. No, <laughs> we're all <laughs> exhausting. <laughs> we're all fucking exhausting on some level. But Alice, can teach us so much about not just the the sex part, which obviously she's an expert at, but the intimacy. You know, how can we use sex as an intimacy tool? How can we make that connection? How can we stop apologizing for being sexual creatures 
and try to pretend that we don't like sex, but do it, you know, learn how to do it, which is meaningful to us. I want to know, you, we know here, Steph and I know men really crave the ability, and we've already mentioned this, the ability to please a woman. You know, do you have tips for our ladies about that? Absolutely. Um, What men really want is to bring you pleasure. They don't want you to pretend. They don't want you to fake it. They really want to know what is it that's going to make you smile? What is it that's going to give you an orgasm? What can they do? And they're, they're, they don't know how to ask what to do. They're, they're afraid to say, oh, but what can I, um, mm, mm. They, they, they struggle with the language. And it's unfortunate because we, as women, sometimes tend to put up these walls and barriers where they're struggling with the language and we're going, ah, you're not really serious about pleasing me. You're, you're full of it. And we brush them off and we don't actually give them the information that they need to please us. Oftentimes what they want to hear is, what is your favorite flower? How do you like to be kissed? Do you like when I wrap my hand around the back of your neck and lean in and give you a soft, intimate kiss? Do you like the way that I kiss you? And they're afraid to ask. They don't know how to ask. And so as women, what we really need to take away is how do we communicate to men what we want in a way that they can understand? And in a way that's genuine to what we truly want and not what we think they want us to want. Yes, exactly. That's such a, that's such a big one. I feel like women get hung up a lot. So with what you do, it seems that, you know, intimacy, communication, connection are huge parts of your work. And uh, you must encounter all kinds of different types of men and women. But in the context of men, uh, I feel like a lot of women feel that they have trouble connecting with men who are not their type. Uh, Jen and I teach that attraction is malleable. We have both had amazing experiences with men outside of our type. While I realize that it behooves you to imply interest in your clients, I get the impression that you are, genu- that you are genuinely interested and often attracted to them. Do you feel that this is part of who you are, something that you learned, a combination of both? I think it's a combination of both in the sense that my level of attraction is a little bit different than most. For me, attraction is who someone is internally more so than who they are externally. So when I'm looking at attraction and what my type is, my personal type is someone who is self-aware. If somebody knows who they are, if somebody is comfortable talking about themselves, there is a way for us to communicate both intimately as well as romantically. And it's it's acknowledging the fact that not everyone is perfectly compatible. And sometimes to make a relationship work, you have to work at the relationship. Investing time, effort, and energy into a relationship that may require a little bit of extra energy because it's not a perfect match, may actually be the most perfect match available to you. Getting to have an experience with somebody that you ordinarily wouldn't expect to can teach you a lot about not just yourself, but the other person as well as humankind overall. You'll start to notice that certain similarities and truths hold consistent across who the type of person is. Everybody wants to, on a very deep level, feel accepted, feel appreciated, and feel cared about. It doesn't matter if someone is an introvert or an extrovert. It doesn't matter if someone is male or female. It doesn't matter if they're into men or if they're into women or if they're not into anyone at all. On some level, we all want some of the same basic things. When we start to discover those basic human truths, it allows us to be able to connect with all sorts of humans and enrich our lives with amazing new experiences. I find that... The biggest mistake that we as women tend to make when it comes to sex and relationships is that we close out anyone that we do not instantly believe is going to be the perfect fit. We brush off the possibility and we don't even give them a chance. My recommendation would be go on the date that you might not be super excited about. Have a dinner with somebody that you ordinarily would not. Date somebody that is the exact opposite of the type of man you're used to dating. Have that new experience and see what it teaches you about yourself. Amen. Exactly. Amen. Okay. We 
are going to start wrapping this up today, Alice. This has been so fascinating. But I do want to leave women, A, with where they can connect with you. Actually, we'll make that B. But A, I want you to give women some really tangible safe sex tips that maybe we aren't using like we should right now. The, the very first safe sex tool is one that I'm extremely excited about advocating for. It is this incredible new drug on the market called PrEP. It stands for pre-exposure prophylaxis. What this drug is, is an HIV prevention medication. It's something that is taken every day in the form of a pill that's a combination of two medicines that have been historically used to treat HIV, but you're taking those drugs prior to being exposed to HIV in order to prevent infection from setting in. So when it's used appropriately, it can change your risk level by 92%. That's extremely, wow. extremely dramatic. There are very little side effects. It's a fairly accessible drug. It's starting to be covered by many types of insurance. And so I really recommend women who are having multiple partners, please, the first thing you can do for yourself, get a prescription for PrEP because it's a great backup should there be condom failure. The second safe sex tool that I'm going to suggest is using the right type of condoms. You want to make sure that you're using condoms that are the correct size for the man that you are working with. If he is well endowed, you should be using a larger side. If he is perhaps a bit on the petite side, maybe use something that's a snugger fit. I recommend going to, let me double check the uh, URL here. They're called One Brand Condoms. The, the URL is onecondoms.com. And they now offer something called My One Perfect Fit. It is 60 different condom sizes. 10 lengths, oh. nine widths, and they have a chart <laughs> online where the guy can literally size himself up and get a bespoke condom that is going to be the perfect fit for him. And so as women, making sure that men have access to the condoms that are going to fit their bodies, an excellent, excellent thing to keep in mind. That could be such a fun sexual experience, though, condom fitting for a man. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh yes and the company will actually send you out several different sizes to try so you find which one is going to feel the best and so as you can imagine getting to test out the different types of condoms is a blast it's a really fun experience and it can be a great bonding experience with a new partner so female condoms a lot of women aren't familiar with female condoms what they are it's a little piece that goes internally inside of the woman. It almost looks like a plastic bag of sorts, but it's significantly more durable. Rather than the protection piece going around the penis, it's actually going inside of the vagina. This way, he is able to thrust into you very, very easily, but you still have a barrier of protection. If you are working with a partner that is brand new or a partner that may have difficulties using condoms on, their, on themselves, a lot of men who have foreskins find that condoms tend to roll down due to how their bodies are built. You can use female condoms. So if you ever run into a situation where a guy is saying, you know, condoms just don't work for me. Okay, you don't have to wear a condom. I'll wear a condom. It gives you a second means of having a option for protection. The third thing that I really, really recommend to women when it comes to safe sex is knowing what can cause issues. For example, a lot of women forget that you can get STDs in your throat just as you can in your vagina. And so you may be tempted to say, give a blowjob without a condom. And I'm going to suggest always use protection because that is still a source of STI or STD infection. So it's really important to go ahead and factor that into your decision making when it comes to sexual activities. For example, when you have a man go down on you, he could potentially transmit an infection if he had something. So you want to make sure that you have all the safe sex items you need, such as a dental dam, such as female condoms, items that fit appropriately. When it comes to other types of specific condoms, I really like for men's use either the My One 
fit condoms so this way they fit perfectly or i really recommend the skin brand of condoms they're like what about for taste mm, i really like this i like skin brand condoms for taste too rather than getting a flavored condom because let's be honest most of the flavored condoms on the market taste awful instead like shit. get flavored oh they do they taste they taste horrible like the banana taste oh I could gag. It's yeah. awful. Or the like the terrible <laughs> cherry cough syrup. No one uh. wants that during a blowjob. <laughs> oh, God, no. Instead, I always recommend using flavored lubes. There are quite a few different types of flavored lubes out on the market right now. You can find everything from kiwi flavored to fruit punch flavored to some companies now even offer a line that tastes like gelato and espresso. Interesting. Wow. And they're better than the yes. flavored condom. Absolutely. Um, for a specific brand, I recommend checking out the Joe brand of flavored lubes. They offer a wide range of different flavors and types of lubricant. And I've got to say, they taste pretty fantastic, too. I never thought I would be that person with five bottles of lube open in front of me, putting my fingers in it, tasting it. But I've been that person, so you don't have to. Trust me on this one. Go with flavored lube. It's much, much I don't nicer. know, Steph. I think after the interview, I want to go lube tasty. <laughs> it's so funny. Like, you, you would never expect yourself to be in a position where you're like, ooh, tiramisu flavor. But I'll tell yeah. you, I have been there going, wait. Tiramisu and chocolate and creme brulee. Yeah, all these are coming home with me. Oh, hell yeah. <laughs> okay. So I have kind of, it might be an ignorant question, but I know if I have it, other women might have it too. Do any of these lubes break like a dental dam or a condom or, or, you know, sacrifice the integrity of them? They can. You want to specifically be using water based lubes that are specifically for use with condoms. Um, the company that I work with actually produces one really high quality option as far as lubes go. And there are a couple of other companies too. Um, believe it or not, the FDA, a lot of us look to the FDA to be a guiding force as to what is a biologically appropriate type of product. But nah. believe it or not, the FDA <laughs> is against lube. They are completely against lubricants they make it okay almost impossible for companies to get clearance to have an fda approved lube so some people make the mistake of oh there's only one type of fda approved lube trust me there is more than one. one type of fda approved lube that okay. that is not the only one available on the market the fda is actually very anti-sex very anti <laughs> Not not exactly uh, pro-women in that particular regard. Okay. Well, Alice, this has been very informative. I want to thank you again for being here and for sharing with all of our single smart females out there. I want to know and where women can find you and what regards they can find you and what you're working on right now. Well, the first place that you can find me is going to be through my website, www.the alicelittle.com and you can also find me on twitter at the alice little each week i do a live talk on a different topic ranging from consent to what men really want to what a sex worker's place is within feminism so the topic changes each week and so you can join in each week for that you can always visit me in person at the moonlight bunny ranch the email associated with that is alicelittle at bunnyranch.com. And that's a perfect place for any sort of in-person experiences and encounters. And I also offer educational services too. So if you want me to talk in your area or present for a group of women, just send me an email. We can talk about that and I can customize a whole class structure specifically for you and your friends to enjoy. I think that sounds lovely. I especially especially women where we could be even more educated on our own pleasure instead of just focusing on the men. I, that sounds exciting. I think we should. It's, it's a should really <laughs> amazing experience to be in a room with a whole bunch of women passing around a vibrator and talking about what kind of toys do you like? What toys are actually designed for a woman's pleasure rather than to look aesthetically pleasing for a man? And 
how else do we get to have that conversation unless we create a space for it? And so I help create that space and make that experience possible. Thank you, Alice, for this. Thank you for sharing so much of yourself. Steph, do you have anything else you'd like to say? Uh, no, I just thank you so much for your time and, uh, and your expert knowledge. Oh, you're so welcome. It's been my pleasure working with the two of you. And I'm really hoping that people will find some great takeaways from the podcast. Oh, they will. Some really good ones. <laughs> lube tasting. That's my takeaway. Oh, well, yes. there was a lot and more, but anyone... I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to run with the lube. <laughs> and if anyone has questions about sex and relationships, feel free to write in and email me. I'm very happy to answer your questions, offer advice, and really help you find the things that you need to have a great sex life. Fantastic. This show is brought to you by Irresistibility, help for women with online dating. Are you experiencing inbox crickets or real life crazies? It's not you, it's your online profile. Let us help you do online dating that leads to real life love and romance. Go to helpmeonlinedate.com and we will send you the first two video chapters of our program for free. This is Jen. And this is Steph. Don't forget to subscribe to our show in your favorite podcast app, as well as share Single Smart Female with all of your single girlfriends. And if you would like to play around to learn more about mantourage dating, come see us at havehimyourway.com. Talk to you next time.